is Dr. Stinky McDougal? You mean the legend? He's a real Buckaroo Bonsai kind of guy. I watched him dice a guy into pieces with six f***ing words. Stinky's the most inconvenient man in most rooms. He's a master of drunk boxing. Every time Stinky calls my blood pressure skyrockets! I heard he's staging an evolution. Dr. Stinky McDougal says the difference between a revolution and an evolution is the conscious choice not to break everything in the transition. And now, broadcasting from the borderless territory of Liberty Valley, Minnesota, here's your host, Dr. Stinky McDougal! Thank you, baby! Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Stinky McDougal podcast, Dr. Stinky McDougal podcast. Today, our guest is Andy Hall, electric universe researcher and catastrophist. Uh, He's had much of his uh, work published on the Thunderbolts website, as well as the Thunderbolts uh, YouTube channel. Uh, He is the purveyor of uh, what I would call quite important and famous discoveries, such as the keystone pattern that we'll get into, and has recently crossed the lexicon of discussing electricity in ancient Egypt. Uh, Andy has a degree in in mechanical engineering from the University of Arizona, mechanical engineering and aeronautics from the University of Arizona, and spent much of his life working in the oil industry. Uh, Andy, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Why don't you welcome everybody and give us a little background on yourself and how you come to the electric universe. Okay, thanks, Robert. Well, as Robert said, I went to the University of Arizona. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, kind of a desert rat. And um, I went to school as a mechanical engineer and I worked for the oil business, primarily building power plants, um, not working in the oil field so much, but but building cogeneration and, and power generation plants. And so that took me around the world doing uh, very interesting projects. I enjoyed it. I had a great career for uh, almost 25 years in the oil business. Then I uh, I got into some business on my own. Some I bought some businesses and tried to run them. Found out that that wasn't for me. Went back into the energy business as a consultant for several years. I worked in the solar industry, primarily building uh, various kinds of solar energy plants. And then uh, retired from that, and I'm retired now, and I devote my spare time, my free time, my interest to uh, electric universe theories. How did and you primarily- find the electric universe theory? I mean, when did you first come to this? I guess it's been about 10 years uh, that I started into electric universe. I discovered it, sort of stumbled on it on the internet, uh, came across the Thunderbolts project, and uh, listened to Wall Thornhill and Dave Talbot, and then just kind of went from there. I ran into uh, videos of Michael Steinbacher and really uh, was fascinated by some of the things that he was putting out. Such a pioneer. And I have a little bit of aerospace background, so I have a little bit of knowledge about um, supersonic effect, and I started to recognize supersonic effect. And actually, Michael was recognizing them, just didn't have the background to define what they were. Uh, he, he did a video where he was talking about these faces of the mountain, these triangular faces. He says it has something to do with the wind. I don't know what it is. And that video, soon after that, triggered me to discover that these were shockwave feet in the mountain. And... That kind of took off from there as far as me becoming a theorist in the electric universe. I find and, that finding uh, those similarities are really important. And your work on the shock waves, um, I'll throw some pictures in from some of your videos because uh, when I did, when I looked at your work on the West Coast, um, you know, your work in particular on uh, the mountains uh, of the Rockies in the California and, and in such in California was um, was. I mean, you know, no one had defined it like that for us. In particular, you had this this block of V-shaped earth that you described electrically. Can you can you share with the folks a little bit? I'll throw the screenshot of that up on here. Uh, here we go. Cracks oh. in the theory. Yeah, it was your video. Oh, cracks oh, in the theory. I, yeah, there's a uh, wedge shaped wedge shaped. It's a uh, called the lambda, and it's a yeah. shockwave feature. 
uh, it happens at a point of contact of the shock wave where it reflects off of the surface. The surface itself will develop this pattern in it called the lambda foot. And that's what's in a road cut. It's a road cut, I believe, in Iran that I found a photograph of on the internet and swiped it and, <laughs> and used it because it's an identical patterning to, uh, you know, what documented as a lambda foot produced by a jock wave. Yeah, here, I've actually got the video it's, video a, it's a series of pressure regimes within, oh, there it is. Inside that wedge, are each layer you can see is at a different angle to the surroundings and the, and the layers shift in, in their uh, vertical height. And that's those are pressure regime. So as the wind blow through and fill this with dust, conform to the pressure regimes in this lambda foot structure which is part of the shock wave structure and and those are the pressure that matches the pressure regimes that show up in wind tunnel tests of shock wave you get the same pattern and so uh this is an identical proof if you will of shock waves and geology okay yeah. Uh, and here's a here's an image, another image from the video of it that shows that that same area of formation. Yeah. Now the lambda foot is down, yeah, down in the yeah, in the contact point. Um, so it you have the other image that shows the diagram of a lambda foot, which I snagged from the internet too. From it's out of a textbook, basically. So, yeah, so this shows the pressure regimes in a lambda foot created by a shock wave. And this is where the shock wave actually reflects. And, and, um, and these pressure regimes bend and, and conform this wedge of where this shock wave reflection is. And all those features that are shown in this diagram, which came right out of a science, you know, experiment, are matching features in that road cut with the exception of the angles are slightly different and uh this has a concave see the reflected shock the the, the uh uh the top part of the y on the right mm -hmm. called reflected shock as it bends down into the lambda foot it's concave and in the road cut it's convex the difference is because of the angle, the incident angle of the shock wave and whether it was beyond 90 degrees with respect to the ground it was impacting to create this reflection. And so one is convex, one is concave. Otherwise, they're identical. And the fact that one, the other one is concave and this, or this one is concave and the other one is convex is just more proof that it's shock wave because a shock wave does that. An acts document and so everything that's on this picture is displayed in that road cut and that's proof of a shock wave as far as i'm concerned it only takes one and i don't know how the uh, mainstream consensus explains that feature they have their explanation but most of them you know most of them are pretty um based on a million years of millions of years of time where anything can happen and they don't have to worry about the physics of it yeah i'm, I'm proud of your work and my work i've never mentioned the word millions in my in my death yeah. you know it is because you know the, when i first started looking at catastrophism i was looking around and you know there's actually a circle in the middle of lake michigan right in the middle a perfect circle and, you know, when you look at things like that, you realize that those perfect circles can't have they, they can't have occurred slowly because there would have been drift in them. Yet the circles that you can form over these are absolutely perfect circles. Um, yeah. yeah, And you can find you can also find geology, uh, though, where you can see a drift. Actually, you can not in that case, but you can see both cases. It's very. I mean, the scars that are left on the earth, once you start really looking at them, you tell a story. And uh, it's when we can unravel, you know. 
You know, one of those stories that a lot of people like to look at, and, and there's been a lot of speculation on whether it was the original home of Atlantis, is the structure known as the Recot structure in Africa. And right. I've got it brought up here on the screen share. Uh, you actually have linked this to the keystone pattern. Um, I thought yeah. it was, uh, you know, quite a, a revealing moment. Um, let me get your thoughts on something. You know, I was I was looking around at what this thing might be co-located with. And it turns out if you take a perfect line at 138 degrees from the Recot structure, you end up here at what's known as the Ogavala Delta in the southwest side of Australia. Does this formation, you know, does this bring any similarities to mind? Or do you recognize what this might be or how this might be congruent with the uh, formation of the Eye of the Sahara? Um, you, 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 you meant Africa and you said Australia, right? Oh, I meant Africa. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> just, just to be clear. Um, if, you, if you turn I mean, Africa on the side, it looks just like Australia. <laughs> it does, actually. And there's a story behind that, too. Um, I'm still trying to unravel. But it's a fractal um, pattern. And Africa and Australia uh, are, are that same pattern. Back up from this, if you would, so we can see the connection all the way to the recap, reshot structure. Yeah. It seems yeah, little... now we can see sort of how it's an alignment across the continent there. And that, that you said that angle was off of, was it? I'm sorry. Uh, 138 degrees off of. Yeah, almost perfectly. Not almost perfectly. It is exactly 138. And okay. it looks like the line that it creates is actually parallel with the Red Sea. And so, you know, what we yeah. look at is, you know, we look at these similarities of, of uh, congruency and, and you just try and look for, you know, how might these be linked in an electrical circuit? You know, one of the things we originally talked about since we have Africa sitting here, um, you know, what, what kind of things as a circuit, if you will, can you say about the topography of the continent of, of Africa? I mean, you've got these burned out brown sections in northern Africa, this green belt in the middle, and a burned out section in the southwest. Right. And then you have this rift zone on the um, on the eastern side of the continent that, uh, you know, uh, continues down from the Red Sea, basically. And uh, and that's a big interesting feature, too. Um so the, the the delta pattern there that's created between those two points and the symmetries of the continent around it, I think, is part of the story of that continent's formation. So, you know, I, I look at the globe, look at the world, and the, and the formation of the continents and and their locations as a pattern, and it relates to um, you know how things were either either nautically deposited or methodically excavated away right. or just left alone. And, and so this, you know, the pattern of Africa is related to the air circuitry. And um, I think that Delta is, is relevant to that. Um, I don't know the whole story. I, I'm still investigating Africa. I haven't looked at Africa as much as I have North America, say. And I haven't looked at it that much either, but, you know, every time uh, something in geology comes up about Africa, it's almost always the uh, eye of the Sahara, and it must be Atlantis. But I don't get the sense that the eye of Sahara represents any sort of, you know, former islands or continent. This looks very much like a round negative discharge site. Absolutely. It's a, I agree. It's a discharge site. Um, the Keystone pattern that I wrote about and talked about the reshat structure and other crater-like formations display this keystone pattern. And, and it's really a set of patterns, but it relates to the fact that a discharge coming into or out of the earth is going to, at that boundary, is going to do something called resonant frequency discharge. And resonant frequency discharge basically takes the energy in that discharge and puts it at 90 degrees, 
which would be across the surface of the earth, the face of the earth. And it has to do with the resistance at that interface. It causes frequency to go up and it goes up to infinite resistance at that point. And that creates reactive energy, which is 90 degrees to the, to the uh, vector of the discharge itself, which is going into or out of the earth. So that reactive energy will display elements of that keystone pattern, either in the ground and features in the ground that are either anodic or cathodic, or features that are posited by the wind that are either anodic or cathodic. And here in the Rishat structure, for instance, there are tetrahedron from supersonic winds that were inflowing into this thing that created tetrahedron. And they are in the position predicted by the keystone pattern where winds should be flowing in exactly the direction they're portrayed uh, in, the, in, the, in the structure. And so that I showed that and I was showing that there are other features in the reshot. There also show where inflow and outflow winds were directed. And there are shockwave patterns in the ground, left in the ground, they're faults. I mean, the consensus calls them faults, but they're from shockwave. And they're at a particular locations where the wind inflects, where you have supersonic shockwaves forming because of the momentum change in the wind, where it's bending around into basically a huge tornado. But it's like a buzzsaw tornado, which is probably the most energetic tornadic asthma tornado uh, that I've seen an example of. And that's why it looks so, so beautifully symmetric and well-defined. Um, it sat here in the Sahara, and if you look at the entire Sahara, you'll see that you know, the dunes to the north of this structure portray winds blowing in one direction and the winds to the south portray winds blowing in the other direction. It sat between two opposing winds. And right. It was just a whirlwind that sat there between them, an electric whirlwind that created this. And but the but it's it was there in that location because of the discharge either coming in or out of the earth at that point. And um so I yeah I agree with you 100% that it was it's a discharge structure. You know, you applied the keystone pattern. I'm trying to bring it up here. I think I'm doing a poor job. Um to the surface of Mars as well and in particular to the formations um created by the giant scar of the Valles Marineris. Um yeah. so You've done, I know you've done a lot of work uh, examining and looking at Mars. Do you have any thoughts on what happened to Mars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. Great question. Um, the uh, structure that we're seeing here is an experiment Michael Steinbacher did. Um, and, uh, and he was attempting to, to create this Alice Marineris, and he accomplished it. And so this is a discharge structure. This is the keystone pattern, or what you know I, I originally came through the pattern from. And uh, and so this is a resonant. This is the L, this is the result of resonant frequency discharge. What's happening is this plate, the dielectric plate that this experiment is being done on. It has some kind of sand sprinkled on top of it. And certain parts of the plate are developing a positive charge and certain parts are developing negative charge. And then the sand itself is developing charge. And then it's rearranging itself electrically according to its charge and that of the plate beneath it. And that's exactly what happens on Earth. You find cathodic and anodic area. So that's what I'm looking at here. So if you look at the, at the cathodic, bar across the center of this, um, this structure within this circle. You see on the right hand side, the arm of that bar ends upward and then fingers out and dendrites out 
to the edge of the ring mm -hmm. structure form. And on the on the other side, it goes straight out and then takes a ninety degree turn along the sort of the, the, the ring structure uh, pointing down. Although there are a few tendrils that are reaching upward and uh, above it towards the ring of the structure, but the majority of it is you know that that ninety degree bend down. So what that is is on the on the right hand side that is magnetic induction. That is magnetic induction. It is patterning that um, that arm outwards and drawing those tendrils across the magnetic field. Or, or magnetic induction follows the, the magnetic field. So as the magnetic field grows outward from the center of this discharge, it's making a ring. So you get the ring pattern. And then the current is in being induced by it. So it's following the growth of that ring outwards. So it's following the magnetism. And that is magnetic induction on the right hand side. The you know, there's left, so much material missing. Where where did all the material go, Andy? What are your thoughts about that? Well, let, let me let me let me get back to that. Let me finish oh. though about this is very important about the pattern. This is ultimately what we find in this keystone pattern over and over again. The, the left hand side, which bends at 90 degrees downward, that is electric field induction. That's due to capacitance. That's because the magnetic ring has it develops a current that flows through it. And this bends 90 degrees to follow the ring. So the right hand side and the left hand side have those differences. And if you look at Mars, Alice Marineris has those same distinctive differences between the right hand side and the left hand side of the of the structure. And it also has the ring structure around it just like this does, and and it has similar current patterns to this. And so that's why I'm pointing what I wanted to point out about Dallas Marineris. So anyway, your your question. <laughs> so if if uh the keystone pattern fits Dallas Marineris, what are your thoughts about Olympus Mons? What what would cause the largest mountain to be formed on the planet? Uh that's so that's that's all part of the same structure. So the discharge that came out out of Mars, okay? Think of Mars as a spherical capacitor. Like all the other planets, it's a shells of layers of shells. So that creates a capacitor. So the energy inside is passing through these capacitive layers all the way out through its atmosphere and for the Earth, its magnetic field. Um, so um, as that energy in Mars was got over... <laughs> something happened. It got hit by an EMP or something of that nature. And it caused it to exceed its capacitance, storage capacity for that energy. And the capacitor blew. So Alice Marineris is very clearly in my mind, in my eyes, a discharge pattern created by a blown capacitor. And it discharged out of the out of the internal of Mars through the crust, and then it looped back and reconnected in a coronal loop, okay? It, it was drawn back and reconnected with the planet at the, um, uh, what do you call it, the um, Tharsis Mons, made those four connections, yeah. four, four primary connections. There's Olympus Mons and then the three other ones, yeah, there's, and then the there's another up. big uh, spot further around the planet. But if you can imagine that discharge just came out of Mars and looped back and hit in those areas, just like a solar prominence would. You've seen the loops on a solar prominence. That's what happened because of because it blew the capacitor. It blew the capacity of Mars to handle the energy that came in. It blew out. Yeah, I'm going to bring this I up right now so people can get a better idea of what we're just what you're describing. Yeah. So on, what my, most people haven't looked at Olympic, haven't looked at Mars as an electrical circuit per se. So at the very top here, we have the Olympus Mons structure, which is 
thousands of feet in the air. It makes no sense. And then you have these three structures just to the, to the side of it in a perfect line. And what you're saying yeah, is- It looks like a washing machine plug. parts are cognate. Looks like a washing machine plug, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it is because once again, we're looking at a, a delta shape, you know, that triangular delta shape, which is yeah. a natural, you know, affectation of how nature handles exactly. electrical currents in terms of managing them and storing them. Um, you know, we you have, if you have three phase current, you have three phase current naturally forms tetrahedral structures and, and triangular structures, delta structures, delta Y structures. So, um, you know, Tesla invented the delta Y connection, I, I'm pretty sure. And when he was developing AC current, he used that delta Y, I think he developed as a junction for three phase. For the three phase and, motor. And he didn't, he didn't come up with that out of his own head. He just looked at nature and said, that's what nature does. You know, that's how Tesla did his work. Yeah, that was one of the things of, of the original work from the Thunderbolts that sparked my interest. They said, you know, look, rivers match Lichtenberg figures, which are an electrical formation, electrical shape. And so I started looking around for other electrical shapes. And, and there are the, the delta itself is manifest all over the earth um, in several places. And my favorite being the island of Rapa Nui. But that we see this on other planets, right. that we see it on other planets says that we're we're looking at something that structurally was happening everywhere. Exactly. And yeah, Easter Island and many other features like the ones we were just looking at in Africa are similar to these features in the sense that they are part of a pattern of discharge from the inside of the planet outward through its geomagnetic field. And it's being stimulated by some event like a big EMP, maybe a big solar flare, maybe a comet, you know, you can come up with a, a bunch of different causes that would amp up the circuitry and create these features. And that's what we're seeing. And this is very similar electrical circuitry wise. This is similar to the features we just looked at in Africa. And I can't say exactly how the circuitry ran and, and developed what's in Africa with respect to the rest of the earth um, off the cuff, because I haven't really delved into it, but I can look at this and know what it is. Mars is a bald planet. It doesn't have an electrical magnetic field to speak of anymore. It's just remnant magnetism. And I think it probably used to have an electromagnetic field like earth and it got blown out when this happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem to have lots of similarities to Earth. Um, it's much smaller, but it's it's it seems to be, you know, it's about 80 percent of the density of Earth, if I understand correctly. Um, and so Mars is one of those uh, interesting pieces that I keep looking at. But, you know, one of the things from that your work and when we first chat, started chatting that I think we both appreciated in each other's work is that we really understand. And I think science will advance a lot. A lot Earth science will advance a long way when we all begin to realize that there is an actual circuit in the surface of our planet and in the surface of the planets around us that could that that influence and almost outright define weather patterns around around North America. You've studied the West Coast a lot. Do you have any thoughts on on the West Coast weather in relation to the structures you've identified? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it's a it's a big broad subject. Um, but I can, I can say that on the West coast and I have looked at North America quite a bit, and especially the West coast and the Rocky mountain region. And so I can talk about it, it things, but basically along the West coast, you have a relationship, all the volcanoes, the whole you know, cascade region, Olympics, all the way up through the, you know, Alaska and all the way down where I am, which is right at the southern end of California, just at the top of Baja, I'm sitting right there. Um, all along there, that is from uh, uh, what I've termed, I mean, I believe, um, have proposed, is caused by um, the fringing effect of 
energy current that is evolving out of the center of the earth it's it's basically trapped as, as uh, by a capacitor which is the the shield of the continent itself and so it's streaming out flowing out from beneath the continent through what's called a fringing field and it's creating that whole line of effects of volcanoes as well as the san andreas fault baja and and um uh, sea of cortez all that structure is all linked and uh just as an interesting note uh, we recently had a uh, hurricane hit us from came yes. up through Baja and hit right here where I'm at, you know, and passed pass through here. Um, simultaneously, there was a uh, uh, a uh, earthquake that happened. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I think it was near Ojai, California, up along the San Andreas Fault, and and coincident with that earthquake the storm began dissipating and the storm had been predicted to be a real severe, oh, it's going to yeah. cause kinds of problems and it, and it poofed out and didn't do much. There were some areas that got a lot of rain. There were some hellacious lightning storms. I, I witnessed one, but it really didn't do what everybody thought it would. I really think there's a linkage between that San Andreas discharge, which is what caused the earthquake got near Ojai and, the dissipation of the storm itself because the storm was falling right up San Andreas Fault, basically. Andy, why and, don't you take just a moment and explain to people, you know, this is an electric universe thing. Why is it that earthquakes are electric? What What is an earthquake in terms of an electrical event? Well, in, in, my, in my theory, I would say it's because of these, um, these fringing currents that are coming up from beneath the continent and they're coming around to the and escaping at the continental plate. And as they escape, they, they form filaments. And so we're seeing the volcanoes are these filaments coming up. And the earthquakes are along the along this whole system and their discharges along that system. Subterranean deep subterranean discharges is, is my interpretation. Now so they like could a big be thunderbolt underground, like like a spark under the ground, exactly. Now Between they, the two plates, along with that, you get you would get uh, vaporization of the you know rock or water and and gas evolution, and and then it would collapse back down, and there would be other associated physics going on with that discharge. I think it's triggered by a discharge. So if the Earth's electromagnetic field is weakening, as scientists have said, does this mean that we're going to experience more earthquakes and likely more uh, violent earthquakes? Well, my thought is that we go through these cycles with the sun. What causes the solar cycles is another question beyond, but we have the solar cycles. And so the Earth goes through these fluctuations of output from the sun frequency and the you know, uh, charge that we absorb energy that we absorb so when we're absorbing we have to be the earth has to be in sort of a balance with the sun and the sun's output but the earth is always inducting this energy from this electrical energy from the sun and when we say and, inducting, you know, as, you as hans alfin pointed out the earth, you know his model of the earth is is of a, a transformer Inducting this current at the poles from the auroral currents, it's inducting into the center of the Earth as a transformer, and then it, then that stores energy. And what he doesn't talk about in his model, which is what I talk about, is that it stores that energy in the capacitance of the sphere, in the layered capacitance sphere that the Earth is. You know, the crust and whatever is inside that. So that stores energy. And so the release of that energy is going to take place through volcanoes and earthquakes and severe weather as this energy releases from the earth. There's a certain amount that's coming out all the time and it's expressed in our electromagnetic field and, and everything. But 
whenever the sun goes through a transition up or down of output, the earth has to go through a transition up or down of output. Either way, it changes the circuitry, it changes the momentum in the circuitry, and either way is going to cause nasty weather, earthquakes, and volcanoes. But you get it on the way up, you get it on the way down. And and if you look in the history of the ice ages, the temperature goes like this in these cyclic up and down ice ages. On the upswing, they have higher volcano and seismic action. And on the downswing, they have the same thing. And so it's at the inflections that you get this energy transfer. It's not, you know, the energy builds up and, and it has to be released. And then there, that transfer is going to uh, manifest as earthquakes, weather, and, and volcano. And we're seeing that kind of, I think, right now, a pretty, well, pretty dramatic um, amount of volcanoes and earthquakes and, and severe weather right now. It's tied to this switch and the sun's, you know, it's going to maximum, I guess, right now. You know, one of the videos that you put out was on the tornado, which is an electric model for the tornado in a positive, negative and a positive, uh, well, a negative discharge. You know, it, it, when we talk about uh, a volcano, are we talking about very much the same model? I have a picture of it up here for folks. I hope that showed up. Um, do you want to talk about the model of a of a thunderstorm? And does this model generally work as a picture of the Earth discharging? There are different ways that we discharge. No, it works as a model of the Earth discharging. It absolutely does. So if you think of thunderstorms, I'll speak specifically of the mid Midwestern thunderstorms that create most of the tornadoes, you know, the big tornadoes. Those big mesocyclones over Kansas and, you know, the Midwest. <clears throat> Part of the reason for that that nobody talks about is the fact that you've got all this flat grassland and and uh and crops and all of that corn and wheat and whatnot growing um it's all producing positive ions into the atmosphere that whole region has a cloud of positive ions hanging over over the surface of the ground all the time and in the summertime in the heat of the summer i think it builds up to really strong levels now you have the jet stream and you have all these things going on that the you know the uh atmospheric scientists talk about but they don't talk about this the fact that you have a weak plasma of ionic plasma forming over the surface of the earth in those areas um just due to the character of the geography and the what's growing there and so you also have storms building up overhead. So all these storms are created by capacitance in our atmosphere. It's created between the earth and the, you know, the plasma sphere in these atmospheric layers where there's moisture and, and it's really water vapor is the current carrier. And, and this isn't recognized because water molecule, you know, is dipolar. And it, it's a charge carrier in itself and it polarizes, becomes what's called a bound current. It's like a molecular current. It's not free electrons flowing down a copper wire. It's the molecular body of, of the water vapor itself. It condenses and, and creates a charge carrier. And so when I look at clouds, I mean, I look for continuity. I look for continuity in the cloud, a vapor trail through the cloud that is continuous throughout. That's a current. And everything that's happening around it is due to magnetism created by that current. And so you see feathered clouds. That's the same thing that I described in the in the um uh uh keystone pattern. It's 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 capacitance. It's it's called straight capacitance. But it's basically the electric field, the far, there's a far field electric field and there's a nearby electric field and there's a discharge through the atmosphere. It's reactive energies are flowing through the atmosphere and then bending to the far field electric field when they get farther away from this discharge. And that's part of why we're seeing the stripes in the clouds. 
Yeah, you see the str I mean, if you look at the clouds, you're looking at the electric field display, basically. Is it do you mean, watch does it seem like so we if have you watch the cumulative clouds, clouds and field organization than we did in the past? I'm sorry. Does it seem like we have more visible striating in the clouds these days? I don't remember as a kid seeing clouds in long straight lines like we do today. Is it possible we're seeing more electrical energy in our atmosphere today than we did 40 or 50 years I, ago? I think it's yeah, I think it's possible we're seeing more ionization going on. And and that could be, you know, a lot of people say it's artificial. I don't, I don't know. I I don't go there um, because I just don't know. Um, if that's creating ionization, or if, you know, if, if anything like that's going on. But you know, I remember as a kid because I grew up in uh, Tucson. There's Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and it, it, Davis Monthan was a SAC Air Base, a Strategic Air Command Base. So I grew up seeing B-52s and U-2s and various fighter jets flying overhead all the all the time and my brother became a fighter pilot and so i was really into i watched every airplane that went over and i remember skies with contrails i was fascinated by them even as a kid and watched them and i watched clouds forming and i remember lots of contrails and i always remember the patterning in the sky but i don't know if it's happening more now i think people are just starting to notice and talk about it more maybe it is. I'm not sure. Yeah, There's I'm no not sure either. You know, I, you know, I asked myself, did I just not notice, you know, planes leaving, you know, 200 mile stripes in the sky when I was a kid? When I was a kid, all my contrails were, you know, fairly short after the planes. I lived on the approach path to O'Hare Airport. So, you know, I saw planes fly over me all the time. And yeah. I, I, you know, I, I've seen contrails. I was actually a crew chief on B-52s. And what's interesting is that the only way you get the kind of contrails that you have today behind some of these planes, uh, B-52s used to have a, a thing that it did when it was trying to carry large loads of takeoff, where it would fire demineralized water into the engines so that it would right, boost yeah. the expansion and then it would boost the thrust. And that would leave a very long line of contrail as it took off. That is what the contrails we see behind what we call you know, if you believe that they're, what they're doing is indeed, um, uh, you know, spraying the sky, uh, it, you know, are they are they trying to affect the electrical patterns in the sky? Or is it just that the contrails are now more, you know, abruptly seen because of the electrical charge? Is there, well, is there electrical? I guess the question is, is there is there a possibility that the change in contrails comes from a change in the electrical potential of our sky? Yes, there is a possibility. And I just qualify that by saying you know, we have to keep in perspective that the number of airplanes flying today compared to just 20 years ago is probably an order of magnitude. So people see more con airplanes in the sky, too. We just I just, you know, we want to factor all those things in and then see if is there really an anomaly here or not. Now, as far as the government pumping stuff into the sky they've done that we know that for a fact that they've done that in fact i mentioned that my brother was a a, a pilot he's a marine pilot he flew a plane called the a6 intruder in the marines and mm -hmm. he was on a detail for a while he was in his assignment was in uh north carolina and they were seeding hurricane and so he would fly into hurricanes and seed them with um uh it'll come to me in a minute what they seeded him with but it was basically to force the, the hurricane to spill its gut it was to help like a dry it ice? On it and, and dump its energy and the intent was to get it to dump the energy out over the ocean before it hit florida or wherever it was headed and so we've been doing that that was he was doing that back in i believe the 70s so the military stuff in the air they put aluminum oxide maybe to what they were using in, in any case there was a no i don't think it was that but uh maybe it was sulfur dioxide something that we were, we were spraying 
Uh, but in any case, uh, so this has been going on for a long time. I read an article not long ago that the uh, Saudis are doing this to help stimulate rain, um, spraying the air and, and using electricity to try to stimulate cloud formation and rain. So it's happening. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's, you know, what bothers me is we don't always hear about. We don't know what we don't hear about. That's that's what I don't know about. I don't I don't doubt that it's happening though. Sure. Um, you know, since we're on that sort of in that subject area, you know, talking about electricity, you recently did a video for the Thunderbolts project called Electricity in Ancient Egypt, which I thought was uh, you know, a really interesting move for this for the Thunderbolts project themselves because you know it, it really steps in the direction of redefining human history completely i want to state up front that i have no training in egyptology i'm an engineer providing an engineer's perspective on what we're about to discuss the topic is electricity of course and how it was used in ancient egypt we'll look at evidence that's been overlooked I think it will enlighten our appreciation for the Egyptians' engineering sophistication and refine our understanding of their spiritual beliefs and practices. This is not to suggest anyone else is wrong, simply that interpretations may be incomplete because of what has been overlooked. We're going to focus on the tools being used by the characters in certain hieroglyphs. It's the characters' tools and attire and how they are portrayed being used that we are concerned with. Um, you know, what What are your thoughts on an electrical Egypt? I'm gonna bring up some pictures from your recent video here. What are your thoughts on electrical on an electrical Egypt? And do you think that they were transmitting the power via lines or or how do you think something like that system was working? Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not, not sure. I, I think that the, Pyramids and other megalithic structures around the world are are associated with each other in a sort of a geoengineered system. And total purpose and everything of that, I, I I don't have a good theory on. I'm working on it. But there's definitely a pattern to where specifically the Giza plateau and and its relation to other megalithic structures um, around the world, uh, there's a pattern there. And so how, how Egypt fits into all that and the pyramids exactly and what they were doing with electricity, I'm not sure. If they were using electricity though, what, what I see in these, what I see in these images is that they're portraying continuity. I know every one of these you know, set of images, of course, there's petroglyphs, I mean, hieroglyphs that show all kinds of different things, not just electricity. But the, in this particular set of them that I was looking at, making making connections, for, and, and there's a continuity throughout the picture between usually involving the, the floor itself. So one, one imagines they're on a stone megalithic floor in, in the you know, in the, maybe in the bowels of one of their uh, structures, uh, pyramids or whatever. But, but stone is part of the circuit. I think that has to be recognized. And then you have these dead uh, figures, which are clearly pastors in my mind. Every time I see someone working with one of the deads, it portrays them touching, making connection across those play. And and so here you see this, this this figure, this cat man figure on the right. Mm -hmm. So those two blades, those dagger looking blades. I think he's in the act of going up to that jet and making connection across those capacitor plates. I think those are tools for that purpose. And where I've seen him portrayed in other, it's always next to the dead. And so I think there's an association. Those are. And I've seen also images where people use their hands to bridge the gap between those plates. So that to me is an instrument that is able to store a chart. 
and it's built to store a static card. And also in these images, I see a whole lot of implements that could be used to build a static card. Things like feathers and furs and uh, 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 fan that put in motion would build static cards just like you know you would rubbing your feet on the carpet. And you could make an effective endograph type generator, build very, very high voltages. And I think that's what they were doing. I think they were building very, very high voltages. Then using these different implements like the onks and the staffs, which are, you know, appear to be either metal or mineral. And using these devices, to make connections and produce currents and electric fields and shock cells, basically, or produce currents within the cells. And uh, I don't know if it was as crude as just giving themselves a shock on the nose. <laughs> I think it was more sophisticated than that. I think they were creating electric fields around their head in particular, using these headdresses and crowns. They do seem to like putting headdresses on, don't they? Love them. And they're huge. They're ridiculous monstrosities. I mean, who would want to walk, really want to walk around wearing one of those things? And they do I have think an they're there for a ceremonial stuff. purpose to perform right. these, these uh, ceremonies or whatever you want to call them. Uh, electricity was, I think they viewed it as the life force and uh, were celebrating it in one way or another or manipulating it for their biologically, perhaps uh, for health or something like that. Um, so uh, the possibilities are pretty wide, and I, I hope other people look into this and discover more than I, because I don't know enough about the hieroglyphs and how to, I'll never learn how to read them, but people who do know how to read them might be able to go in and reinterpret some things and learn some things that way, I hope. Yeah, well, and hieroglyphs, I think, represents something unique because, one, if if some if someone, we don't know whom or to what extent of humanity they, they belonged, if someone was utilizing electricity, right, then the question is, what were you doing with the electricity? And and how and how exactly did you come up with the knowledge of of this electrical force? Um, you know, it's always one of those big questions I I, I look back at, um, especially when we're looking at it with it, with Egypt. Do you have a thought on what um, what the pyramids might have been? You know, a lot of folks talk about there having been a uh, water flowing underneath it. Is there possible that current flowed through waterways underneath it in the same way that you talk about water being a conductor as a, uh, a dipole alignment? Yes, absolutely. I, I think the pyramids and almost all of these other ancient megalithic structures, you know, the really old ones, the ones where the, you know, the stones are monumental, gargantuan, and fit together like puzzle pieces. Uh, then they're found, you know, in Cusco, Peru, and they're found in Egypt and, and, and around the world. I think that is from an era when the earth was in a higher state of potential with respect to the sun. They say if the sun camps up, the earth has to too, all the planets do. And right. we see this. You can look at Jupiter and Mars and their temperatures have gone up and down with solar activity just, just like the earth does. It has you know, obviously nothing to do with CO2. And so... Um, uh, you know, we so we see the outer planets responding to the current and, and the vibration, let's say, from the sun. And so I think they lived at a time when those vibrations, when that frequency and potential, if you raise the potential, you'll raise frequency. Right. Potential was higher. And that's because, you know, the Earth has its own potential within the solar system. So it's a bubble of potential within the solar system and you know it's it's like an electra or it has properties of an electra because it has its own internal voltage so that voltage has to balance with the voltage of the system that it's in because it's within the solar system it has to fit within a certain orbit and a certain 
you know, activity level, potential bandwidth and matches what's internal or else the thing would explode, right? Mm -hmm. Like Mars did. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy, since you talked about it, um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was your theory on planetary formation. You know, what are planets? And it's your thesis that they represent electrodes. What is an electric? Sure. I'm going to try and find a good picture of it. What is an electric, and and why do you think the planets themselves may be electrodes? Well, in my understanding of an electric, or at least my definition of what I'm seeing with the Earth and the other planet, is that they have, as Hans often theorized, they have a induction, or an induction motor, a transformer inside is inducing the solar energy into the planet, storing it in its capacitive layers, and then discharging it. And with the discharge, capacitors don't flow energy out constantly. They discharge. That's what capacitors do. Induction goes smoothly, draws energy in, capacitance discharges it out and, you know, in patches. And so we have thunderstorms and we have you know, bursts of these different discharges that are exhausting energy from the earth. And the real energy, like in a thunderstorm, those sprites and other, you know, ghostly discharges are going from the clouds up and they are delivering huge amounts of energy away from the earth. And I think that needs to be recognized. The, the flow of energy isn't necessarily coming yes, down too. just because we see a lightning bolt coming down. That's you know that's not the right way to look at it. And so what we have are areas of sinks and you know where energy is flowing out, and we have energy flowing in. It's you know uh, it's the description of the Earth being filled with low pressure and high pressure areas. Exactly, high pressure, high and, in, low pressure and low pressure areas. areas. You have it, it pumps energy in and out. And it's following these magnetic field lines primarily that are coming through the Earth. So you have specific locations on the Earth that, have, that are repeating. They've been there for centuries and they'll be there for centuries because they're built in when the Earth was created, certain circuit. And so that's why we see certain areas that are going. Look at Lake Maracaibo, for instance, where it has a monstrous under electric storm Actually, 365 days of the year, every night. Really? That is a node in a circuit where this capacitance is regularly discharging every time the earth turns. It's just... It's, 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 it's a does. spark in the, in the land. Interesting. <laughs> and that's what a capacitor does. So that's what, that's, that's what I track. And, and, you know, you see hot spots and the cold spots and... And, and you can draw lines between them and they make X's and Y's and, you know, so forth. <laughs> you, you know, one of the big bubs, hubbubs, if you will, amongst the community is whether the question of catastrophes is still in our future. Do you see anything that says we need to worry about another major catastrophe like the ones that formed, you know, the West Coast Mountains and shockwaves and, and formed the parallel lines of the... Uh, Red Sea and, and and Africa, you know, do we see something like that again on the, is the crust going to skip? What do you think is, is the potential? Are we overblowing what could just be a large storm or could something really traumatic happen again? The answer is yes, it could. I, and that's not to suggest that I think it will, but it's happened in the past. There's no doubt about that. And could it happen again? Well, we don't know enough about it to say whether it could or not. And so that's kind of where I stand on it. What I can, what I've seen from my looking at the big picture of the planet, and um, you know, I see these patterns. I talked about the Keystone pattern. There are elements of that on the Earth, and and that were obviously there as part of its formation, and so I can trace those, and it, it tells a story. What I'm seeing is the Earth has flipped. We have had a topsy-turvy of the poles. And, it, and I'm not 
I don't think it was crustal displacement. I think the whole friggin' thing flipped. So, so I'm still working out some of the details about how to explain that to everybody, but I will be writing it up and talking about it and giving my thoughts about this. I know that there's a lot of people who have talked about this in the past, either in the terms of crustal displacement or in more recently in terms of the magnetic pole chip. And there's that Chan Thomas CIA, supposedly that document. I don't think the CIA had anything to do with it. It came from them, but I think it's Chan Thomas character. Um, I would say he's at least partly right. At least partly, you know, some of his thesis says that portions of the crust thrust, you know, thousands of feet up and thousands of feet down. And my thesis is that it expanded creating massive ocean depths and creating mountains like the Rockies in huge, you know, layers up. So it it, it took what was a relatively, my thesis is it was a fairly relatively th- flat surface itself. Um, in the Bible, they call it the plains of Shinar, right? And then what happened was we had oceans form and we had mountains form in this cataclysm. And this is where we got the modern, you know, geological setup. I don't think you and I are that far off on, on the idea that it was a catastrophe that created the current uh, geography or geology that we see. It's just a question of, you know, what was the origin of that? Was it an EMP? Was it a comet? Was it a planet? You know, there's, there's, there's a question of what caused those in the past. And now the question then is, you know, what could we possibly face in the future? Do you think we risk uh, a major X flare? And if we get a major X flare, what, you know, what sort of defenses might the earth have or what can we do to, to bounce back from that? Um, the X flare issue is uh, one that we should be shielded from if we were smart, but we're not. <laughs> So I came from the power industry and I know the problem with these big, large transformers. Uh, you know, I used to order them myself and they take like 18 months. You've got to order them before they get delivered. And and uh, so if those get blown across the grid, we're in a world of hurt. Now, I think there's probably a lot more backup systems that we don't know about in reserve. But haven't been very much well reported if they are there and that just makes me nervous um because there could be a, a big a big issue i mean if a big solar flare hit it could blow out all kinds of systems and our computers would fry and that sort of thing so um it could happen any day any given day i don't i think there is actually protection in the system if you start looking at Earth as an electrat, I think it's like sending out a signal like shoot this way, sun, basically. I think sun has a preference to shoot the other way. Yeah, people out. talk about the fact that we have, you know, we'll have these, sun, these these sunspots and they'll come right into us. And as soon as they get in front of us, they stop firing. And then they get past us and they start firing again. Right. And that may change with the pattern of the rest of the solar system. I right. mean, maybe the yeah, we don't know what alignment system can cause could be, alignments. Could put us right in the firing line at certain times, but I think in the majority of the times we're out of the firing. That's just my perspective on that. And um uh you know, I don't know what we could do about it uh other than harden our system. You know, it, it largely couldn't cause us physically any any problems, although it you know the frequencies might, but I just, potential for I heart attacks, like mental illness issues, you know, those things that have been things, Yeah, just I mean the moon goes through its phases and we feel those effects in our body, you know. Absolutely. Quite drastically, women especially with their menstrual cycles. But I you know, I feel different from a full moon to a new moon. My moods change quite a bit and it's a regular thing with that periodicity so and i think everybody does to a degree whether they are aware of it or not so the heavens affect us and 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 i think there could be at times when we're in the firing range of the sun but i don't i don't know how to uh how to block it unless we build a big screen or something <laughs> right 
Yeah, no, it is. It is a good question. I, I do wonder because, you know, when we look at the pyramids in Egypt, a number of which look like they've been blown up. It makes me wonder if these weren't um, collecting, you know, as a connection to electricity and then overloaded, uh, it, you know, yeah. seems to me as one of the very possible solutions to their demise. Yeah, see, I would worry if, say, there was a nearby supernova. And the sun's going to feel the effects of that and overload. And that's right. when it's going to give a big blow off. And that's where we would be in real danger. Um, you know, on so, that note, so that's, funny. and I think that's, uh, there are past supernovas that correlate with past catastrophes. And so, you know, that at least according to the consensus timelines, if you go with, with those, and there's some question about that, the radioactive mating method and that sort of thing. But, um, but still, there's a correlation that appears there. And so that's interesting. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. There are notations by some authors that right after the explosion of the Crab Nebula, it seemed to have driven some tribes, in particular in South America, there are tales and legends that they migrated in that period due to it, which makes me wonder if the Crab Nebula isn't closer than we think it is. And that, you know, I mean, if it's as far away as we say and we see the Crab Nebula explode, it should be thousands of years or a thousand years or at least, you know, a thousand years. Well, if you, if you consider that. that energy travels at the speed of light, but if you have, you know, if you have Kirkland current, and there's scalar pulses that in, within a longitudinal wave, which you know, consensus denies the existence of longitudinal light waves. They're, they think they're photons that they're looking at, you know, little right. yeah. particles of nothing, <laughs> whatever. Particles of nothing. <laughs> um, you know, those are interference patterns in a wave. So um, anyway, I think that... Um, <clears throat> that information the pattern is instantaneously available throughout the wave longitudinally and transversely so the pattern is the information that's the geometry that's the that's right. the mathematics that's the information it's there that's why when they look you know they look at, at a coherent light over here in a two-slit experiment or something and then they look at it over here they're both doing the same thing no entanglement well it's information is instantaneous because it already exists in the waveform in both places and so uh, that's my interpretation mm -hmm. so um um anyway that's that's my interpretation of that. Yeah. well andy listen we, we're just hitting an hour here and uh, i've really it's, uh, the hour goes so fast um, but I did. I tried hard to make sure that we had a, a number of my favorite subjects that I wanted to cover today. Is there any last thing you want to talk about or anything you want to share for the folks about the Electric Universe or anything you're working on? Um, well, I am working on A Bad Day on Mars, as I have been for several months now. Um, but I want to bring it to closure here pretty soon. Uh, I have a, a pretty good body of work drafted. I just have to sit down, buckle down and dust it off. But I think that'll be an interesting article coming up. I think it'll be popular, I think, people, because everybody's pretty much questioning this Mars and Valles Marineris. We've talked about it for a long, long time. And I hope to just describe exactly the features of it and how they got there and, and make a propose a theory that that hopefully people will take a look at. But that, that's kind of my main next goal in life is to kind of get that out there and finish that work and then go on to the next thing. Uh, all my, all my work sort of, I go from one thing to the next sort of like leg bone, to knee bone to ankle bone. And just, I'm just following the circuit, if you will. And, um, and making it where the circuit lead. And I hope everybody starts looking at everything is circuitry because that's, that's really, that's really what's going on. Our biology in the, in the solar system, in the galactic systems, in the cosmic system, it's all circuitry. It's a and it's all waveforms. It's all vibration, frequency vibration and energy, as Tesla said. Yeah. 
that's what it is. And yeah. so I'm glad you're on point looking at it. You look at it the same way I do as circuitry. And that's, and I appreciate that. And I thank you for having me on. Yeah, I do. I really appreciate our time today. And uh, I thank you very much, everybody. I'll have Andy back on for another podcast uh, in the future. There's so much we can talk about. And uh, we really just kind of glanced across a number of things here today. With that, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, everybody, don't forget okay. to leave me a comment down below. And uh, don't forget to hit that uh, subscribe button and uh, share this around on the web, if you would, because the electric universe is not just the future. It's our past. And it's what the entire thing is really all about. With that, thank you, everybody, and peace out. Ooh, oh, 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 oh.